Welcome to Brooding with Lois. This is Lois Richter, and today I have a special guest. His name is Don Shore, and he and I have been working together for 15, 17, 20, a long time. <laughs> we work together on in Davis on the radio station and have uh, joint custody of the Davis Garden Show, which is a weekly radio show about gardening. And he's the expert, and I get to be the, well, I get to be the perpetual novice is what I get to be. But today, I ask him to come down and talk to us about gardening to attract birds. Well, of course, being Don, he said, and beneficials. So here we go. Hello, Don. How are you? So this time the tables are turned and I get to be the novice who asks the funny questions about birds and talk about plants. Uh, we're here to talk about gardening to draw wildlife, but I'm not a bird expert by any stretch. I do want to emphasize that there's a lot of other wildlife that we garden for when we plant things that draw, draw birds. And so as we go through some of the pictures, we'll be emphasizing things that will make beneficial habitats for birds, as well as all those other things you may or may not be seeing in your garden, the butterflies and dragonflies and all the little insects that are helping to control the pests in your own garden. So we like to start with one that is both the bird and a pest for gardeners, and that's the white crowned sparrow. Lois and I on our radio show go back and forth about this bird because it does a significant amount of damage to gardeners, especially in the winter months here in the Sacramento Valley where we are. And uh, we talk about all the ways to discourage it from your garden and all the things we've done to encourage other kinds of birds. And fortunately, sometimes bite us because they come back and they encourage a bird that does a lot of damage in the garden. We like them. They're cute. We let them hop around. But that, we thought we'd start with that one as a kind of a running joke that Lois and I have going. But as we talk about birds and plants that draw them, their flowers, their fruit, the habitat, the things they need, there's other things that benefit clearly from that as well. And there includes a number of very beneficial insects, some of which are quite recognizable such as dragonflies, which eat a lot of white flies. Dragonflies are completely beneficial in the garden, and they're something that will be enhanced by planting the right kinds of plants and giving them the care that they need as well. The lace wing here shown by my porch light. I like to use the porch light technique for monitoring the beneficial insects in my garden. Leave your porch light on, and if you see some aphids out on your roses, Keep checking under the porch light in the evening and see if the lace wings show up or the other beneficials, you know your problem is likely to solve itself. This is a leather wing beetle or soldier beetle. These are voracious aphid eaters. There's a particular thing you do in your garden that encourages them. So we'll come back to that later on in the program. Everybody knows this one, the ladybug or ladybird beetle, as it's properly known in its adult form here. It's feeding on thrips on this particular plant. And there's lots of things we can do to encourage them that kind of mimic the same sorts of things we would do to draw birds and other wildlife into the garden. So these are the four things that every organism needs. If it's going to make a, a, a home in your garden and help you out, or just be something you enjoy watching, a food source, some kind of water source, Nesting sites, habitat, I guess, is another term for that. And most important, I, in our opinion, and particularly for drawing birds into the garden, is cover. This is a story. I, I, we bought a farm in the mid-1980s, and it's row crop land. And if you're watching this or listening in a place where it's not agricultural, let me explain what that means. Here's the house in the mid-1980s, and that's the farm all around it, right between crops right there. Perfectly level. Uh, they make furrows, they ditch around the whole property, pull a ditch around the whole property, fill that with water, which has some great advantages for wildlife right there. And then they siphon the water out from the ditch into the individual furrows to grow the tomatoes, sugar beets, field corn, uh, winter wheat if it's in the cooler season and so forth. And the big advantage of that, uh, these farmers that we bought the place from were not gardeners. They didn't even water those trees that you see there, but that deep irrigation they do on the whole property when they're ditch irrigating has the advantage of watering those great big trees that you see. 60, 70 foot sycamore to the left, uh, 50 to 60 foot walnut to the right. And so we had two levels of birds when we bought a row crop farm. We had the birds are way up high in the trees. This is a magpie nest. I took this picture probably back in 
oh, 2000, 2001, very early digital image that I took, maybe even before then. And magpies, the, the yellow-billed magpie, as Lois can tell you, was very common in the Sacramento Valley. People came here to see it because it's a uniquely indigenous species here. See how I use the birding term there? And uh, they are big, flocking, congregating, screaming, squawking birds that would take up residence in these great big messy nests in a very high tree. And uh, about mid part way through the summer, uh, some kind of raptor would invariably come in, plunk itself down firmly in that nest and stay put for as much as a day to a day and a half. Well, the magpies would swirl around it and scream and squawk and attack it and eventually give up and the whole flock of magpies would fly away and the raptor would take up much quieter residence in the big trees on the property. So these are the birds we were seeing when we first moved in. Turkey vultures, um, uh, red-tailed hawks, Carriers were common, though I don't think they were nesting high up in the trees. Lois would know better about that. Uh, the the um, uh, horned owl. Hawk. Swainson's hawk. Swainson's hawk. Uh, horned owls would take up residence occasionally. Never in the same time, mind you, one of those species would take up residence in this tree. But these are birds that need something like this enormous walnut tree that's on the property. They build their nests just by stacking them up there very informally, very loosely. And in fact, they'd come down you know, partially in any windstorm we'd get. But uh, these kinds of trees would bring in a particular kind of bird. And then down at the ground, whether we're running the ditch water and, fill, and watering the sugar beets, we'd get the ground birds, which would be turkeys, pheasants, chukers, uh, those three not particularly native, the quail, of course, native bird, and they loved it. They loved the moisture that was being provided by the ditch irrigation and the low level of cover that you would get with most row crops. Every now and then, if we were lucky, the farmer would grow field corn, which in the rich soils here would grow 10 to 12 feet high. They would dry it all the way to harvest drying on right out there in the field, standing there rustling in the field. And when they would mow it, pheasants and chookers would run in all different directions. So these are the two levels of birds that we saw as non-bird people, ground level and way up high in the trees. And there are other birds that were there that you perhaps weren't noticing. Um, one, I'm, I'm not sure it's possible to not notice. It's the scrub jay. And this is a California scrub jay. They're beautiful. They're blue and gorgeous. And they are the ones that are the corvids in charge. And they're sitting up there at the top of the trees with their attitude and, and yelling and squawking and having a good time. They're related to the magpies. So scrub jays were certainly there, but maybe not as noticeable. Not and then, noisy. <laughs> That's the difference. Not as noisy. Not as noisy. No, because <laughs> the magpies live in communal places. In other words, the magpies would have a whole bunch of them in one tree. And then, you know, across a couple of miles away, there'd be a whole bunch of them in another tree. Well, a while back, we had the uh, West Nile virus, and it wiped out so many birds, especially corvids, lots of Yellow-billed magpies, lots of crows, some jays. And so the population dropped. Since the magpies want to live together, when half of them went away and died, then they went and merged with some other leftover group and made a different thing. So we have still have magpies, but they're in much more distant Things. Yeah, when the, when the magpies were decimated by West Nile virus, of course, they dropped it. I'm, I remember an estimate of 90% population loss in the area. You would still see magpies. But what happened, in my amateur opinion, was the jays rebounded or filled that niche very dramatically. And it is a distinct niche in the in the farm and the garden because these are birds that jays are more or less omnivorous and would feed on garden plant, a garden produce to some degree, but mostly nuts in the orchards, which are widespread in this area. You know, as we all know, walnuts, almonds, pecans are widely grown in this area. And uh, the jays became the dominant corvids and then mockingbirds. And in my own property, flickers showed up in very large numbers as well, kind of filling that middle level niche. We didn't have that we could see a lot of what I take to calling songbirds, but Lois knows better the types of birds we're talking about, uh, the intermediate range birds, not the ones that run around on the ground like your doves and your quail and such, not the ones that are way up high in the tree, but the ones that are in between in the bushes. Why? Because the farmer we bought the place from hadn't planted any bushes. These were farmers. They didn't plant ornamental stuff because it didn't make money for them. So we had the opportunity to do that. The very first thing we did, well, we figured out what we were going to plant was I planted a row of sunflowers. 
voila, suddenly we had hummingbirds. The sunflowers are phenomenal uh, for their ability to attract hummingbirds into the garden. And most people don't think of them. It's not an intuitive flower for attracting hummingbirds. There's all these rules and lists you're going to read when someone writes an article about how to attract hummingbirds. And they'll tell you tubular flowers and red and blue and all these kinds of criteria. Well, a sunflower is a composite flower. In fact, the old family name I learned in college for the whole family of daisies was compositi, which referred to the structure of the flower or really the inflorescence. It's a whole bunch of little tiny flowers packed together in the middle of what you're looking at. And the ray flowers, which are predominantly male flowers, a ring around the outside making a giant target so that anything way up high in the sky can see this flower and come down to it. And then what they do when they come down in a picture that I'm afraid was not as clear as I was hoping it would be, that's the flower of the sun. The, the, those are the flowers of the sunflower inflorescence with a bee poking its head way down inside there to get nectar and inadvertently, of course, picking up pollen on the way. So in fact, a composite flower, an aster, a daisy, a sunflower is a zillion little tubular flowers. And as far as a hummingbird is concerned, it's a smorgasbord. Uh, you've just set it up there where it can sit there for a full minute or more poking its beak into each of those little tubular flowers and getting the nectar reward that it's after. So the reason I mentioned this is and uh, actually this picture is a really good illustration of something else that daisies do. They make targets, they make landing pads, they make something that insects and, and uh, birds will see, butterflies will see to zoom in right on that point to get to the pollen. So they actually have these markings. In some cases we see them, in some cases we don't. Uh, they're sometimes more visible to the, to the birds or insects than they they are to us. But what the sunflower is doing is drawing these insects and particularly hummingbirds in from quite a distance and quite a height. They're doing something else. If you've ever grown sunflowers of the old fashioned Russian mammoth or gray, these the ones that are grown for seed, you get a very tall plant. I have an old picture of me on top of our garage roof at the age of 10, measuring a 14 foot sunflower I grew when I was a young teenager, well, almost a teenager. Yeah, 14, 14 feet to the top of that thing. And it made a two foot sunflower. So you're making something that birds can stand on, roost on, land on, and survey the whole scene below. So it's a really simple thing. And I like to emphasize this because almost anybody listening or watching anywhere can grow some kind of a daisy. There's a season for sunflowers. It's very specific, but there's lots of other daisies, members of compositi, as we used to call it, now called asteraceae. These are China asters. China asters grow in the summer. There's a true aster. That's the uh, perennial form. So the first one is annual. Second one's perennial, meaning it lives from year to year. Cosmos, a very popular summer daisy that's very easy to grow. You wait till the soil is really warm to plant it and it'll bloom all the way through the summer and fall. And if you watch Cosmos, it's not just hummingbirds, but also butterflies that are attracted to it. This is a California native wildflower called Medea elegans. Medea elegans with a very unelegant common name of tarweed. It's got a beautiful daisy flower. It's showing you on the flower in the back of that picture how the petals cup and curl during the daytime heat because these grow in the southwest. They grow in the hot parts of the United States. Then they open out flat in the evening. A wonderful Honey scent comes out of them in the early evening, drawing other pollinators to them. And then this plant is an annual, which will grow and flower through the summer and reseed and the seed blows down the road. So you only have to plant this one once or twice in your garden. you will happily naturalize in other parts of the garden. And it's a California and Southwestern wildflower. You'll find many of the daisies will grow fine in dry soil, but do better in moist soil. Uh, so you'll get bigger plants if you water them, but they'll still grow adequately with some drought. This is Gloriosa daisy, the common uh, brown-eyed Susan, except this version has green eyes. And uh, these are very easy to grow in that center part, that little ring in the center part. That's what the hummingbird is going to, to get the nectar reward that's there. So just want to emphasize this. So for someone who's got a bare backyard and you're trying, you're a beginner, you want to plant something easy, straightforward, you can grow practically anywhere, plant a daisy. Oh, daisies are wonderful. Sunflowers are wonderful. Hummingbirds are wonderful. So, Don, what other kinds of things do we have that might help a bird? I'm looking at, isn't that uh, bamboo? That's bamboo. And uh, one of the very first things we planted on our farm, because my father and mother were very active in the American Bamboo Society and great enthusiasts for bamboo, was we took about a half acre and planted a bunch of different kinds of bamboo. Now, when I give talks about this topic to people who I can see, I see arms fold 
And I see some people sit back and they're saying, bamboo, that's going to take over your yard. And there are types of bamboo that will happily do that. There are types of bamboo that will cover entire mountains and provide food sources for panda bears. These are clump forming bamboos. There are running bamboos and clumping bamboos. This is one called Alphonse Carr. This plant is 20 years old and has spread a total of five to six feet at the base, fanning outward to about 10 to 12 feet across. Now, why would bamboo be something you would plant for birds? This is textilis or weaver's bamboo with that beautiful blue color when they first emerge. So there's interesting reasons for growing bamboo for its ornamental value, but what it really provides from a wildlife standpoint is density. The very first place we saw hummingbirds nesting on our property was in the clumps of bamboo we planted, partly because they're fast growing. So it was one of the first things that provided nesting sites and cover. But it does something else that I think is really important. And it's a take home, not just for bamboo, but other grasses. Bamboo is a big, giant grass plant. It's essentially a grass tree. And if you look closely at these pictures, you'll see bamboo leaves gathering moisture from fog or mist and dripping it down to the ground below, much as coastal redwoods do. They're harvesting moisture just from fog or mist or drizzle rather than requiring rainfall. They actually are gathering the water and dripping it down below. So they're providing moisture and water is one of the crucial things for providing birds and other forms of wildlife. There's another way that they do this that's quite fascinating, actually. It's called guttation. And if you look at this particular fern leaf bamboo, it's a cultivar of Bambusa multiplex. At the end of every leaf, there's a droplet. That wasn't dew, that didn't fall out of the sky as rain, and it didn't form in the form of fog or mist. It's from inside the plant. It's exuding little droplets of water on the tips and the edges of the leaf. And there's no question that many beneficial insects and certainly some smaller birds and others make use of that moisture because it's provided from inside the plant regardless of whether we've reached the dew point that morning or whether there's been any rainfall regardless of the atmospheric humidity this is moisture coming from inside the plant you'll actually see this on your rose bushes occasionally they also do it right on the edges on other grass plants such as shown here out in the landscape and even on house plants occasionally sometimes your split leaf philodendron or your golden pothos will have these mysterious droplets on the edges or tips of the leaf it's coming from inside the plant due to osmotic pressure from inside the plant so it's internal moisture being provided that's extremely important for beneficial insects and probably for birds take home from this is that one of the important things to put in your garden can be ornamental grasses of one form or another you may not have room for a fifth or 20 or 30 foot tall bamboo clump, but some ornamental grasses can help. So those are the second things we planted, sunflowers and then bamboo. And now here what you see is where we started planting, as most people will who actually like gardens, shrubs at different levels, some ground covers, some low shrubs, some bigger shrubs, a little tree, that's a baby ginkgo tree that's much bigger now. And what this did, we noticed right away, even not being bird people, what this did was it provided cover for birds that would come out onto the ground to feed or in the, the ground cover or even right out on the driveway there. As soon as you walk down the road, they'd scurry back in and go up into the shrub nearby. Uh, Lois has terms for this. I believe you call them avenue plants. <laughs> Boulevard plants? A uh, bird <laughs> corridor. corridor. <laughs> yes. So you want things that have a, a habit where they can quickly run into it, where they can disappear into it. All kinds of birds that I didn't recognize were doing this. They would just disappear from the ground into the lowest plants nearby and up into the shrubs. So we're providing a place for them to feel safe, a place for them to be protected where they can watch us until we've gone by and they know it's safe to come out again. So we planted two plants that I want to highlight. One is a California native and one is a Mediterranean native. I think that's an important point to make. You're going to borrow plants from other parts of the world, and you're going to also focus on plants that are native somewhere in California. And as we get drier and there's more years of drought, we're going to want to focus on plants that can tolerate drought and also plants with an informal growth habit so that the birds will feel comfortable, not a tight, dense growth habit. To the left of this picture is Ceanothus, the wild or mountain lilac or California lilac, not the lilac your grandmother grew. This is our native Ceanothus. And on the right is rosemary or Tuscan blue rosemary, a very upright form of rosemary that makes a very, very large shrub. We immediately noticed small birds very active in these plants. Partly, 
uh, because they'll occasionally have aphids and other insects that are not particularly harmful, but that provide a food source for whatever birds eat those things. Partly in the case of the Ceanothus, we enjoy the flowers and the butterflies certainly enjoy the flowers and bees enjoy the flowers, but they also set when they're done little tiny fruit that you barely notice. And I'm quite certain that certain types of birds, songbirds or whatever you wish to call them, feed on those little tiny fruit. I don't know, Lois could tell us what kind of birds would be likely to be going after small fruit in a shrub like that. So the, the ones, the picture that were just up there are the yellow rumped warblers. And almost any warbler is going to be interested in finding things that have um, little insects or little tiny seeds. They have to be small seeds. If we had other birds like the house, bit, house finch or even the house sparrow for that matter, uh, they could too. But mostly we're talking about little warblers. Mm -hmm. And something, a pest that has shown up on rosemary that is a bit of a nuisance, but people ask about it, and I always tell them, just don't worry about it, is spittle bug. A rosemary will get it. It looks like someone spat on your shrub. It looks a little bit of froth there. A fair bit of it can show up on rosemary and lavender. There's a little tiny insect inside there. So I just tell people, don't worry about this. Either it will go away on its own or something will come along and feed on it. And it's not really harming the plant. So these are plants that can sustain some levels of food and I guess also particularly provide cover. And bees like both Ceanothus and rosemary. So I wanted to mention both of those because they cover a lot of territory in terms of the things we're trying to do. But what we ultimately did is shown in this picture here, a mix of different landscape shrubs grouped together so that there's some higher and some lower, some things with more horizontal branching. This was more of a design thing. It wasn't anything that I was doing specifically for birds, but invariably as I would walk down this path towards those redwoods that I planted down there, lots of birds moving through there, watching me, monitoring me. And one thing that I would have at each end, one end of this, there's a holly plant. The other end of it, there's a mahonia plant. If any of you know mahonia, it's been moved by taxonomists, the people who name plants, into the genus Berberus or Barberry. And that's because it's more closely related to that than they thought before. Well, these are scratchy plants. And I would think, why on earth would a bird want a plant that's got scratchy leaves or something like that? Why do so many of them go into those? And the answer, of course, is to avoid the cat. <laughs> Really? I mean, it's, <laughs> if it's a small opening and a bird can get through, then they can duck in there and uh, not be followed by a predator. And in this particular case, they also have flowers midwinter. So the Mahonia aquifolium, which was the yellow flower that was on the screen a moment ago, blooms December, January, February in our area. Not much is blooming at that time of year. So you're getting some flowers that actually draw beneficial insects. And those flowers, in the case of Mahonia, are followed by fruit. I've tasted them. They're rather astringent, but certainly the birds seem to like them because they all disappear. And as time went by, we would plant smaller trees and bigger trees and shrubs in these kinds of groupings that you see here. And without really meaning to, we were creating ladders and horizontal branches and ways for birds to move very rapidly through the cover. If you go to the, the this particular slide, it shows Meta Sequoia. Glyptostriboides, one of my favorite plant names, the Don Redwood, when it's in its dormant phase in the winter. And if you look at those branches, they are very bird active, even in the winter time, because it's very easy for them to move through there and then back into the shrubs nearby. So I was planting trees and shrubs that were complementary, it turned out, to creating more habitat for what I'm calling the intermediate level birds. So one of the things that... Uh that I discovered living here at my house is that I, at the time, was putting out seed for the little ground feeders and white crown sparrows, golden crown sparrows, juncos. They're here in the winter. They enjoy our, our company, but they eat seeds. And so I would put out and nothing happened. And I figured it out. The birds, white crown sparrow flock, were in the bushes at the edge of the of the ark at the back edge like 20 feet away they did not want to get 20 feet away from from a safe place to come and just have a little snack so what i ended up doing is it was this is winter time and i would go out and find neighbors who had cut little bits of uh, of twigs or branches or whatever i built a brush pile halfway between the, the bush a, a and, duck the, wind. <laughs> and I, I put it there so they could come, they could get in the brush pile. They felt safe there. And it was a good place to 
duck into if a cat came along or something. And then they could come out and about five feet away from the brush pile was a comfortable distance for them. Don has problems with white clown sparrows. And I keep telling him, don't plant your garden next to the bushes. <laughs> All these things <laughs> we're doing. He stays in the bushes and your garden is within five feet. Oh, it's going to be a good snack. There's no question the pattern of damage by white crown sparrows is on the edges of the garden. So you just learn to put up with that or plant the things they're attracted to. But yeah, it, it, it illustrates the point that the cover is what they want and it needs to be fairly close into where they're, they're active. And so just planting shrubs and flowering things and trees, lower growing trees in particular at different levels, gives them the freedom to move quickly through these kinds of environments. Now I planted something else that works for those of you who might be in a larger lot as we are. The Lady Banks Rose, Rosa Banksia lutea is a beautiful rose that, uh, excuse me, Rosa Banksia normalis is the one I have, the white single petal version of the Lady Banks Rose. Planted one right away. I had always wanted one. The largest rose in the world is the Lady Banks Rose in Tombstone, Arizona, that I believe covers over 10,000 square feet. So this is a big, big plant. It's also thornless, so that's good news for those of you who might be planting it on a fence somewhere. It makes extremely dense foliage. It blooms only for about 10 days, but it's spectacular when it does. And it very quickly covered a fence and went at least 40 feet down the fence and about 20 feet up into a nearby tree. So the Lady Banks Rose has the potential to engulf trees and such if you you aren't careful. This is the definition of cover. If you want to plant something to make bird, not just bird cover, but all kinds of wildlife habitat, we have had foxes nesting under our Lady Banks rose because it's so dense and so solid with foliage all the way to the ground and covers such a large area that they felt safe having their babies in there early on in the years when they started nesting on our property. So this is a, a rose, but it's not a rose like your grandma grew. This is a species or wild rose that will cover quite a territory. And there's a number of roses in that category, and they happen to check a lot of boxes in terms of bringing in wildlife. They have food sources for insects. Insects themselves are food sources for birds. They make cover. They make that kind of habitat that we're after. And uh, this picture, although it's not real clear, is a bourbon rose, an early 19th century rose called La Reine Victoria, super fragrant, 12 feet tall, 10 to 12 feet across, and a solid mass of not just foliage and flowers, but also thorns. So in this particular case, the birds will be very happy to head in there. And then very early on, this is a very early picture I took way back when of this category that the rose growers, the rose industry calls landscape roses or shrub roses. They're being sold for their landscape value, their disease resistance, their low care. You don't have to prune them if you don't want to. Let me tell you, if you want to draw wildlife, this is a great way to go. You can just plant them and let them sprawl, let them become dense and fairly thorny thickets because thickets are great for wildlife and they will bloom away very happily. Prune them if you want, don't prune them if you don't feel like it. These are not, these are not long stem cutting roses. These are great landscape plants and they great, make excellent wildlife habitat. And the, the fact that he's out on a farm, he's not in a town, means that he's getting more birds than we would. So the... Uh, California tohi, also the spotted tohi, uh, really like that dense cover because they can get in there and they hop around. And um, but they're not something that you would see in your, you know, your neighborhood if you right. live in in town. Right. So the the point being to provide cover, but you also can if you have enough space provide nesting sites. And uh, we've noticed some very specific things. I believe that the next pictures are going to be large evergreens, if I recall. So we're, we'd be looking at... Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was switching the slides, but I wasn't. That's a, lar sorry. that's a large evergreen right there. This is a deodar cedar I planted the day my daughter was born. That's uh, 35 years later. It's about 60 feet tall and about 40 feet across. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of nesting in that. Look at the profile on it. But every time I walk towards that tree, there's a raptor sitting on top of it gazing down at the rest of my farm. So you're, you're making roosting sites right there. And in consequence of seeing how active this one was, I started planting more conifers in groups. And the next picture should show you, there's a blue ice juniper, there's a deodar cedar, a young one, and a whole hedge of grevillea. So here we have plants from various parts of the world that are very, very drought tolerant. These plants are irrigated about once a month in a, an area where we get no rainfall 
from the 1st of May through about the end of October. So these are well-established, very drought tolerant. To the right is a Scots pine, blue ice uh, juniper, and a deodar cedar just getting going. And then that Australian grevillea hedge, that's where the foxes nest. Now, you've got dense cover, prickly stuff, lots of year-round cover. So different animals and organisms have different seasons when they need that protection. And I don't do anything in this area particularly. You can see around it, that's our native California grass. Uh, that's what was on the property when we bought the place. We got them identified as California native species. So we're conserving them. That's what they look like in the summer. So it's bare brown in the summertime, but we still have the cover nearby that the birds like, and, and particularly the, the foxes and other animals. Now in a smaller yard, you can plant these, what I call cemetery trees, the Italian cypresses. They're not real popular for a lot of people because they're so formal looking. We had to take one down one time when we were landscape contractors. And as we got halfway into it, we realized that there was a nest of blue jays in there. And the owner had us hold off for a while until they could figure out what to do about that. Uh, they, that density that they have provides great cover for nesting for certain species. So the conifers have their place. We're in an area here where there aren't that many conifers to choose from. Up in the Northwest or rainier climates where they get 30 or 40 inches of rain a year, you have a lot more to choose from. Here we have some very drought tolerant conifers that can make great nesting sites. This is a really simple way to draw all kinds of birds into your garden. Plant a mulberry tree. I know we planted it for the fruit for ourselves, but you know, a mulberry, this is the uh, Persian mulberry, per, uh, Morris nigra, and it can produce thousands of mulberries over a period of about two months. They continue to fruit over the, most of the summer. And can, you can see in that picture, there's ripe fruit, there's unripe fruit, there's fruit that's not even turned red yet. And you can pick them for the first week or so. And after that, the birds will be so excited about your mulberries, you're probably not gonna be picking any more. But what they really do, and uh, the reason I'm very happy that I planted them at either end of my vegetable garden, just by happenstance, is the jays absolutely love mulberries, as do lots of other birds. So they come in and they're attracted to the mulberries and it's summertime when the tomatoes are growing and the other vegetables are growing nearby. And I've watched this. I sat and watched one afternoon as this went on all afternoon. They'd land in the mulberry, they'd eat some fruit, they'd fly out and land on a tomato cage. My five foot tomato cages, they would pop down into the tomato. You'd see them come out with something wriggling in their mouth, usually some kind of a stink bug or a, or a, a leaf footed bug. They'd fly on to the next tomato cage, do the same thing. and they'd go all the way down to the mulberry that was at the other end of the vegetable garden, have some mulberries and come back and do it all again. So simply by planting a mulberry somewhere near my vegetable garden, I essentially got complete control over all the group of insects that we call stink bugs. The leaf-footed bugs and the stink bugs and the bagrata beetles and the harlequin bugs, all of which are harmful in the garden, and now I've got something that's coming in and controlling them. I don't know which other birds eat those large insects, but the blue jays or scrub jays, I should say, do a great job of it. Scrub jays and mockingbirds are the two that you would find in residential areas. And that's where you'd find people's gardens. So that's a good match there. Um, you can get other birds that are controlling insects that you may not notice. Uh, for example, let me pull up a slide here from... Come on, I know you're there. There we go. So this is a barn swallow. Yeah. Now a barn swallow builds a nest up under the eaves of the barn. And so that's, a, that's why they're called barn swallows. They have a forked tail, so they're very distinctive. They're the only swallow in our area that has a forked tail. They are constantly flying through the air and swooping up insects that are flying around next to them. Another one is the black Phoebe. And the black Phoebe is a bird that we've seen out in the fields a lot. You see it where it's going to be a standing water, like in the little creek or at the arboretum, there's a little waterway that doesn't flow anymore. And they're out there, they're, they have their favorite twig. So they'll go sit on a twig, go out and catch something, come back, sit on a twig, go out and catch something. And they have now come into town because in Davis, we stopped spraying chemicals on all of the city properties. So all of the parks and all of the walkways and everything, no more pesticides. So those little, uh, Black Phoebes, now you'll see them sitting up on the peak of a, a, a house and swooping down and getting something. And you'll notice that they have a little uh, pompadour. That's what we call it, little, little 
crest that's right there. I think these birds and dragonflies give significant levels of pest control on white flies. White mm -hmm. flies are a very common problem in the vegetable garden on tomatoes and squash and pumpkins and others as you get late in the season. If you're spraying for those, you're not going to get the pest control by the birds. Uh, and you will get surprisingly good levels of pest control simply by encouraging the things that feed on them in flight. I, barn swallows were very common on our property when we had a barn, when it got you know, got too old, fell down, got taken out, they kind of went away. But you would see them out there right at dusk uh, and obviously doing a lot. And the dragonflies, of course, in great numbers frequently as well. So you can get very good pest control by encouraging these this type of wildlife into your garden. And there are birds that we don't see in the garden itself, but in the trees and bushes around. These are called bush tits, and they come in little tiny flocks. They they make their way around a neighborhood. They don't they don't live in one yard all the time, but they're amazing little things. And they'll come along and they'll just clean all the aphids out of a tree or clean all the little tiny insects off. And they're they're very they're cute, they're fun, and they're quite useful. I wish we had pictures of those stink bugs and things, but we didn't think about that. We've got a slideshow for the planet. Happy to provide them anytime. <laughs> but yeah, I'm known for looking up stink bud and leaf footed bud. Yeah. So what else did you want me to show? Let me try this one. What about, hold on. Uh, so the next the next thing that we planted after the mulberries, this is another type of mulberry. This is a weeping form. So I show this one because this one will fit in a small garden. This is a weeping fruiting mulberry. It's grafted up high and it cascades back down. And when my kids were young, I cut a door there in the front so they could use it as a, as a play structure. The only problem was when the fruit came on, the mockingbirds in particular were so territorial that they would shriek at my children who would run with fear from their little playhouse. So they could only play in there when it wasn't active fruiting season, which unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at it, is much of the early part of the summer. But it is something that fits in a small yard. And the density of its, its branch structure is such that the birds like to hide in it. Next thing we planted was a couple nut orchards. These are pecans. Pecans, walnuts, and almonds are very commonly grown here, especially walnuts and almonds. I can tell you that scrub jays like pecans so much that they are a major source of crop loss in places where people grow pecans to actually make a living. Five to 10% or more of the crop can be lost to scrub jays who get in there, peck open that hole, drop it down to the ground, go down and break open the nut shell, share it with the ground squirrels, and pretty soon your whole crop is gone. So uh, nuts are a great way to drop birds to the garden. From a home garden standpoint, we can look at it as a positive thing. As a home gardener, a pecan tree is a very, very, very large tree, and it has a lot of aphids and things that would not make it desirable in a typical backyard setting, but an almond or a small walnut tree might be. But bear in mind that you're going to be sharing your harvest with them. Uh, persimmons are another one that you're sure to share with birds as they ripen. And generally speaking, the crop is big enough. If you look at the picture on the left there, that's my six foot five son standing in front of a Fuyu persimmon in a particularly heavy crop year. But by our grid count, there were about a thousand fruit on the tree that year. So we picked off whatever we could from about the bottom 10 feet and all the rest was enjoyed by innumerable types of birds that I can't recognize, but the one I did definitely recognize was the cedar waxwings, which came in and enjoyed them a great deal. So you will get some crop loss if you're planting some of these things. You'll have some injury to your fruit trees because of birds that like to feed on fruit. But generally my experience is they're not the problems in the garden. This isn't like when the tree rats come in and decimate them or the squirrels come along and knock off every plum. You'll be sharing some fruit with the birds. It's not likely to be your major problem. And with something like a Fuyu persimmon, which I've allowed in that picture, this is my tree, about 25 years old, allowed to grow completely naturally with just a little bit of training. The crops will be sufficient. I suspect that you will feel okay with sharing 10, 20, or as much as 50% of it with the birds. There are things we can plant for that fruit, uh, fruit that we, we may or may not eat, but which will certainly draw these bigger birds. Now, this is Arbutus marina, which is a hybrid Arbutus. Arbutus is the genus of, most people know, the native madrone or the strawberry tree, which are two other species of Arbutus. Marina is cool in that one, I have pictures of flowers on Arbutus marina every month of the year. These little pink hanging urn-shaped flowers are present every month of the year. Hummingbirds love them. Go to those flowers whenever they're present. And then the berry crop on this is light. So unlike its cousin, the Arbutus unido, which sets so much fruit that it's a real nuisance to, to homeowners, this one sets, let's say, 50 
and they're pretty and they turn red. And then these larger birds come along and knock them onto the ground and eat them. Yes, they're edible. People who are really into foraging will tell me that they taste delicious. My experience is they're mealy, bland, and not all that great. But the birds definitely seem to like them. So Arbutus marina, an evergreen tree, which will grow naturally to 30 to 40 feet, but actually can be very effectively pruned to as little as 15 or 20 feet without much effort. And these are uh, gold finches, which would be actually this is the um, winter plumage. So they're kind of drab compared to other things. But they are also, if you look at the bill, you'll see they can eat small seeds. Mm -hmm. If you looked at a bill that could not um, eat small seeds, then it would be like very fine and thin like the flycatchers are. So as we choose shrubs, there are several criteria, and uh, this is longer than people are going to want to read, but I just want to mention flowers over a long period, lots of seasonal bloom with the different things you choose. And we live in a place where you can have things blooming every month of the year, and it's a good idea to do that for the bees that are present, the native bees and others that are present even in the wintertime, for the birds that are out and so forth. Um, Flowers that provide specific things, so they're open enough that they can get in to get the nectar, get the pollen. Many insects feed on pollen, many birds go in after the nectar. Uh, we want them to have exposed pollen in the case of many of those beneficial insects we talked about at the beginning of the season. Fruit for someone, fruit that you're planning to eat, fruit that you're growing just for the birds or hopefully to share. I think it's important to have foliage that is differing textures and branch structures that are different so that things can move readily in and among them and find their own particular niche. And of course, a very important characteristic as we're landscaping going forward is drought tolerance. I also should mention tolerance of heavy soils for those listening or watching in the Sacramento Valley because we have soils that hold water and we do flood as well. So we want plants adapted to our soils, our extreme heat, our intermittent droughts, our intermittent flooding. In other words, we need to choose plants that are climate ready for this area you're probably going to want some plants that are higher water and you'll put them closer to the house. But we're gonna look all around the world for plants that are suitable here. California natives, plants from Australia, South Africa, the Mediterranean, places that have a similar cool, wet winter, dry, hot summer climate. Grevillea, shown here, is an Australian shrub. There are about four, 450 to 500 species and cultivars of Grevillea in Australia. It's one of the most common shrubs there. They're uniquely adapted to California. They can take drought. They can take our rainfall pattern. Many of them are cold hardy enough to go down below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is colder than we almost ever get here. So they're very well adapted to the valley, as well as a number of varieties that are adapted to the coastal areas in the Bay Area of California which are more frost, frost uh, sensitive types. These blooms are on the plant almost year round on many of the cultivars of Grevillea. Uh, they're strange, curious shaped structure. You look at them and you wonder what bird is this possibly for? Well, it's for a nectar feeding bird in Australia where they have no hummingbirds, but you know what absolutely loves Grevilleas? Hummingbirds, they think these are the best thing ever. And they go to all of them, particularly the pink and red flowered ones, but they do go to all the grevilleas because there is, there's a sufficient nectar reward in there that if you break off of an inflorescence, a flower cluster, whap it against your hand, you'll have sticky nectar on your hand from the flower. There's that much sugar in there and the hummingbirds absolutely love that. Plus many of them are prickly. So the effect actually in many cases is kind of like a juniper or that kind of a conifer. That's why this hedge of pink pearl grevillea that I've had now for 25, almost 30 years, I stopped irrigating it completely 20 years ago. It goes all summer long without supplemental irrigation. That's where the foxes on my property are nesting because deep inside that they feel completely safe and all around it. Anytime you walk by, it's very active with aggressive hummingbirds who are defending that territory. What does that tell us, Lois, if they're defending the territory? It means they like you. It means there's a nest in there, I would think, probably as well. Probably. Possibly. You probably have a lot of nests that you don't know about. This is a plant from Texas. So that's another place we're going to look to for drought tolerant plants. The American Southwest, Texas Ranger, Leucophyllum frutescens. This one blooms in these massive cycles of bloom about every two months, uh, spring, summer, and fall. When I get close to this in, on, on a sunny day, sunny afternoon, the bee activity on it is so pronounced that you can hear the plant buzzing. It's that kind of a bee attracting plant. Also, hummingbirds do definitely go to these flowers. I have no idea if they're getting a nectar reward, but they certainly enjoy going to them. Texas Ranger.
This is the Mahonia. The first one we showed you back when we were talking earlier was the native Mahonia aquifolium. Well, there are Mahonias from Asia that are also very adaptable here, very drought tolerant, big, bold, dramatic plants. This plant is eight feet tall and about eight feet across. And I took this picture on Christmas, on New Year's Eve, um, the picture on the left. So this is a plant that's in full bloom in the middle of winter. And those flowers are attractive to various forms of beneficial insects. That color of yellow is well known to attract insects of all kinds, particularly beneficial insects. I don't suggest having curtains in your house in that color if you don't like having bugs show up on them periodically. The flowers are followed by these steely blueberries. And this is true of all the Mahonias, whether they're native ones or the non-native ones. There are Mahonia species all over the Southwest in California, as well as these Asian species. And these big fruit hang on there and I just watch them disappear. So obviously I've tasted them. They're, you know, they're tart, astringent to me, but obviously birds of some sort are enjoying them. And uh, this is a plant that gives flowers midwinter, prickly, prickly leaves. Each one of those leaves terminates in what looks like a spine. So you can imagine that if a bird is trying to hide from that feral cat that lives nearby, this is a great place for it to go. Many shrubs, regular old India hawthorn, this is a big one here. I noticed very early on there are lots and lots of birds on there. I don't know what they were going after. Lots of flowers, so presumably there were insects coming to the flowers, possibly aphids or something on the plant itself. Just look for things that give a lot of bloom all at once or bloom over a long period of time and try to mix and match those so you get more flowers over the greatest period of time. That's really the key. The greatest abundance of, of bloom will give you the greatest abundance of wildlife. Oh, you keep talking about this plant that you didn't have a picture of, and it's in Xylosma. And uh, so here's a picture of a that I took of a white crown sparrow in the in a nice bush. Xylosma, very common landscape shrub, and there are certain common landscape shrubs that are actually great for enhancing wildlife and drawing birds. In particular, if you prune them more informally, if you Xylosma, shiny Xylosma is grown in USDA zones 10, 9, I think that's it. I don't think it's hardy into anything colder than that. It's one of our most common, very drought tolerant commercial landscape plants, very commonly clipped within an inch of its life. So all you have is this, this dome of, of new growth all the time. And you don't have much branching going on on the inside because when you're constantly pruning a hedge that way, it slowly thins out on the inside and you don't have anything in there for the birds to work on, no branching or anything. It's best if you can prune these lightly, do size control pruning, prune with your clippers, not your shears, and do it in a very gentle way. Because if you can imagine being a bird or a wasp guarding a nest or something like that, and someone comes in with this gas powered thing and goes after the shrubbery that you're standing, that you're living in, you're going to be mad. You're going to come out mad. And if you've got a stinger, you're going to sting. And if you're a jay, you're going to scream. And uh, if you can do it more gently and just seasonally, you'll have probably a greater chance of wildlife sticking around, I guess is the way I'd like to put it. And xylosma also has one other feature that almost nobody notices. When it's in bloom, it's extremely attractive to the European honeybee. It's again, like that, that Texas ranger, it is so attractive to them that you can hear the whole plant buzzing, even though you don't really notice the flowers because they're kind of a yellow green. They're, they're so abundant in bloom that they, the honeybees are all over them. And they're wonderful. As I lost them, is my favorite bush in the whole world. You can prune it up like a tree. You can prune it back like a hedge if you want to. If you have to do a hard pruning every now and then for size control, you can do that. It's got dormant buds that'll re-sprout and it makes the right kind of cover for the kind of birds we're talking about. Okay, well, let's see what else you've got showing up here as okay. good things to plant. you got more roses. Isn't we talked about roses, and we've talked about roses that are wild and sort of crazy roses, but these are, uh, I just want to emphasize, if you're doing a rose garden, try to have some of them that are single or semi-double. That simply refers to the number of petals in a row. This is a semi-double uh, rose, which has two rows of petals, not a whole bunch of petals overlapping and hiding that pollen and nectar that's down inside there. So the little insects in particular that want to get in there and feed on pollen and nectar can get into this plant flower very easily. Whereas if it's very doubled, it's not as easy for them to do. This is actually a, a commercial rose called Betty Boop a big floribunda rose named after the, the, the comic strip character. And uh, it just happens to have this very lovely flower that opens out rather old fashioned looking. 
And this is another one called Flutterby. What's cool about this rose is the one on the right is a newly opened flower, and the one on the left is a couple days later. So it actually darkens as it ages, which is a little unusual. And again, this is a single flowered, single petal, you know, single row of petals, single flowered rose, we call it, with all the pollen exposed. So the insects that feed on pollen have easy access to that. Find to plant all those other roses that you like, but plant some of these as well, or even go in for very old fashioned roses. The pink one that was on the screen is Rosa Gallica. That's a rose that was, we've been growing as humans for more than 2000 years for perfume, but look how it opens out super fragrant, but also that the, the anthers, the pollen exposed. And rose hips are actually a nice feature of roses. What's interesting is I don't see birds breaking into them and eating them or anything like that. I see insects feeding on the very end of them and birds sitting there pecking at the end of them, perhaps gaining some of the fruit that's on the inside because rose hips are, you know, in fact, edible, but they're a nice feature of roses as well. So rather than deadheading and grooming and clipping those off all the time, leave them on late in the season. They'll be hanging on there in our climate well into the winter as a nice winter feature. And then there's common landscape shrubs that have this bonus of fruit. This is Sarcococa. <laughs> <laughs> it's my Stand, favorite word. Standing joke we have uh, it's a, a plant that will grow in total shade. It blooms, this picture was taken in the winter. It blooms midwinter, extremely fragrant blossom, gardenia-like scent on this little tiny flower. And then these little berries that come afterwards. Now, I don't know what birds feed on those berries. I don't know if every berry that comes on a landscape plant is something that's eaten by a particular type of bird, songbird or otherwise. But the more plants you have that have an abundance of bloom and some fruit and some density for cover, the more birds you're likely to get. And this one will grow in complete shade. By comparison, Viburnum tinus, which is shown here, blooms midwinter. So again, even hummingbirds will go to these little tiny tubular flowers, and then they're followed by, and I should back up, hummingbirds in the winter? Yes. Yes, we have hummingbirds yes, here in the winter. We have, hummingbirds, so. we have resident hummingbirds that live here all year round, and the earliest nest I know of for a hummingbird was January 1st. That's, <laughs> That's about as early as you can get in the calendar year, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you want to have flowers out there in the winter time for the hummingbirds. You want to have flowers all year round if you're listening in or watching in a climate where you can do that. And the hummingbirds will go to any flower that's out there in December, January. I guarantee it. They'll check out anything. So having something that's blooming is very helpful. That plant is the flowers are also followed by little steely blueberries. Hardly anybody notices them except apparently some kinds of birds because they certainly disappear. So I wanted to um, quickly go through this next set of things. This, by the way, is a black chin hummingbird at an Australian tree called a bottle brush. Yep. And then we come to my favorite flowering plant, which is right. a uh, butylon. butylon. And so Don only put in two pictures for a butylon, and I said that's not enough. So I added a few. So when people ask us about plants that will draw hummingbirds, and we want to say, you know, they'll visit just about any flower that you have. But this next series that we'll finish up here with are flowers that we know attract hummingbirds, flowers that are specifically attractive uh, and that keep them coming back. And a butylon, sometimes called flowering maple, which is a very confusing name, is actually a hibiscus relative. It's in the mallow family, malvaceae. And hummingbirds go to any member of the hibiscus or mallow family. But a butylon is a great one because there's so many different kinds. There's even new forms that are bedding plants you can grow if you're living in a climate which is too cold for them to be outdoors and they'll be attractive to the hummingbirds. And the abutiline come in the fully open form, the cupped form, the tight, the the pinched ones, yep. bell form, and lots and lots of things. And here's proof. Right here is proof. They grow inside. I have had abutiline in my house and it was blooming all winter long. So they basically initiate flowers all year round, no matter where they are, even when they're outside and temperatures are below 30 and the leaves are curling up because of the cold, they're still putting out flower buds. And so they'll be blooming early. And I have pictures again of the butylon flowers every month of the year. So we're getting uh, near the end, not really at the end, but I wanted to do a couple of things and make sure that we got our thank yous in. So first, I want to thank our sponsors, the DVE store and Office Hours for providing us with the tools that we need to produce this show. There's a crew in the back end who's doing all this stuff and you know it's pretty amazing. While Don and I are just sitting out here talking and showing pictures and stuff like that. And we want to thank you 
I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're seeing this. I hope you come back. I hope maybe you'll want to be on the show sometime. Maybe you'll want to, I don't know, be on the cruise sometime. Anyway, so thank you for that. And now we'll go back. This this advertisement is now done. And we will go back to our previously recorded. No, we haven't recorded it yet. Our previously explained. No, I, there's some previousness here. Let me see what I can pull up that Don will laugh at. Here we go. I'm going to do that one. There we what go. What is that, Don? That's a sunflower field here in Solano County, which is the next county over from Davis, Yolo County. Sunflowers are a big crop here, and uh, I, one of the, our favorite things to photograph in this area. I wanted to show this one, which is the comparison of when they got the place <laughs> and what it looks like now. I wish he had taken one from, from the same position. So I you can't. Can There's trees in the way. <laughs> See it, you know, yeah. there's so much stuff in the way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. That's what happens when an avid gardener moves out to the country and has unlimited space. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Don, let's, let's wrap this up and do our takeaway. So people who are wanting to attract birds to their yard have a couple of things they can do. You, get, you gave them that four things, which are. Food, food water. Nesting sites, cover. Cover. Okay. So that's that's fine. But understand that depending upon what the bird is, they may not come to your yard ever. So then when there's those giant big birds, you don't have anything that that is big enough for them to eat. Well, except another bird, maybe. Uh, but that's probably not very <laughs> <do> much fun. <laughs> <laughs> We've watched that happen more than once. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's that's the natural life of things. Mm -hmm. The other thing to consider is what, where are you putting the food? So if you've got seed eaters like the sparrows that are coming in the wintertime to join you and you put it on the ground, you'll get the ground feeding birds, the doves, the white crown sparrows, that sort of thing. If you put it up on a table, you'll get some other birds. If you put it up in a feeder, you'll get other birds. If you've got a special bird who needs a special thing, you might put out a suet feeder. Well, that's not going to get the insect eaters, but then the insect eaters are only going to come to your yard if you've got insects in it. So not poisoning your yard. Is yeah, tolerate, tolerating some level of pests and, and other insects out there and being aware that all the things you're doing to encourage birds, going back to the very start of the program, you're also encouraging beneficial insects that will give you very good levels of pest control. Gardeners who live in the same place for a long time and have lots of flowers and shrubs and things going on and moisture find that they don't have problems with aphids and white flies. They show up and something else comes in and takes care of it. And birds are part of that. The birds may be eating some of the beneficial insects. That's part of the cycle of life. But there's just this whole ecosystem going on. And most people aren't aware of those littler insects and organisms we were talking about. It's all the same principles, just on a smaller scale. We didn't mention water very much. And a lot of times when you're just watering your yard, the water percolates down and then the leaves are wet and then there's a soil underneath it. And so between those wet leaves and that wet soil is a little interface where a lot of things can do real good That's stuff. It's an extremely important habitat for the leatherwing beetle, which is a voracious aphid eater. And it needs about 14 or 16 months in the larval stage between moist decaying leaves and soil. So simple thing you can do, take away from this. When the leaves come down off the giant trees you live under, rake them up if you must, pile them someplace, make sure there's some moisture for them, and you're creating habitat for one of the most important aphid eaters in your garden. And another thing you can do is put a very shallow thing, you know, a, a little plate, a shell, right. something yeah. out in your yard where the sprinkler will occasionally sprinkle it. You want to make sure it is shallow enough that it will evaporate between times so you're not making mosquito habitat, but that will provide a place for enough water to be that the little things can come and get it. And whether they're, you know, the snakes or, or lizards or birds or insects or butterflies, you know, it provides just a little bit of water. So, Don, we've only got a minute and a half left, and you want to know what I want to do? I want to go as fast as I can through these plants. There you go. You ready? All right. Oh. You say it. I'll, Red hot I'll poker. It. Red hot poker. Penstemon. Gloriosa daisy. That's a salvia. There's another salvia, another oh, salvia, another salvia. <laughs> now, there's snapdragons, which we grow here in the winter. 
zinnias, which are classic form of daisy. Okay, and then I skipped a couple up there, so... Those are red buds, which is actually, this particular one is a non-native red bud, but we also have a Western red bud, which are great for bees. There's our Western red bud in bloom right there. And uh, that's the Chilopsis or desert willow, which is a Southwestern native tree catching on in Northern California because of drought tolerance. There's our native Toyon, red and golden berried versions of that. Very attractive to birds as well as beneficial insects for the flowers, which are what you see right there. Heteromely, our beautifolia, our California Toyon. There's the Mahonia in bloom midwinter. And these are Ribes, one of our favorites for drawing hummingbirds because they bloom in the late winter and early spring. And that's a wrap. There you go. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, listeners, for coming and joining us. We really appreciate the fact that we get to do this. It's so exciting. And thank you to the crew. Let's see, there's... Um, well, I can't name everybody, but I'll put up a slide with it later. How's that? All right. And we're out of here in 15 seconds, Don. Don, hey, you know what? We could take this recording. We could make a radio show out of it, couldn't we? At davisgardenshow.com? Yeah. And people could send in questions at davisgardenshow at gmail.com or, well, whatever. <laughs> say, say goodbye, Don. Thanks for listening.